busy moms, it goes without saying that we are entitled to our necessary breaks to keep keeping on with our many expectations of mothering. And me, your host, Flantha, is the mama down to join you for the necessary distraction we all need when life gets too hard, too real, and too much. Join me for an hour of necessary distraction of laughs, cries, and everything in between from adulting, culture, relationships, confessions, and beyond. Welcome to The Necessary Break. I'm your host, Philantha. We sit down and talk through postpartum, the not-so-pretty, how to support more mamas, no matter who you are, so you can let them know that they are loved and worthy during this time. We start with talking about my current toddler day. Oh my goodness, this morning was interesting and so worthy of it, and it definitely is a learning lesson for us all. And then processing friendships like adult female friendships as millennials, and finally the few things I wish someone would have done for me, even though our culture, our moan culture, don't normalize it, especially during the postpartum phase. So the theme obviously today is postpartum, and I can't wait to get started with you guys. So this morning, I'm going to start off with this story, okay? So my toddler, she's three. Her name is Avery. And, you know, most days, you know, we enjoy waking up. I get up an hour before she does just so I can get ready, settle myself, meditate, calm myself, ground myself for the day that's about to come. So that's about 6.30 in the morning. And she usually sleeps in about 7.30. So it gives me a good hour to get myself ready, to get her stuff ready and ready to go. It's the middle of winter right now. It's a point I get the car started, I get her lunch ready to go, I get her bag ready, my bag ready. So just lots of little tidbits that makes the morning routine. And so this morning, 85% of the time, it was fine. She woke up earlier than expected. She loves getting ready with me. Not a big deal. I got her ready. We went downstairs. We had breakfast and she was hanging out. She was reading some books. I just got back from putting everything in the car, started the car up and her shirt is off and her boots are off and her socks are off. And at this point, I don't know where her socks went. I literally was in and out in two seconds and she is screaming and hollering and I have no idea what happened. Mind you, she's not one to naturally go and find trouble like she's pretty good about being interested in things that are available to her such as she'll jump off the couch but not until pillows are down she'll go and a letter to santa or she'll go and read some books by the time you hear this it'll probably be like not during the holidays but right now it's just before christmas so right now usually so pretty much she's good with her busy work Anyway, she's screaming and hollering and I'm like, oh my goodness, what happened? And, uh, well, she won't, she won't put anything on. And mind you, we have minus 10 minutes before we have to leave, get to the drop off lane. And usually that's a bustle anyway in the morning. Um, it allows me to listen to a story with her. Anyway, just part of the morning routine. So what actually happened was she was screaming and I couldn't reason with her. I gave her options. I gave her the time in order to choose and she was not choosing. She was just not having it. And so I sat with her, held her hands, did some breath work, stayed calm. And at that point, she started to whimper. And so no more tears, but whimpering. But I attempt to put on a shirt and oh my goodness it's like I pinched her and we start all over again right oh my goodness this is like very draining and I'm like we had such a good morning what happened so sometimes toddler life is that way so this morning the only way to put clothes on her was buckling her shirt naked with pants and no socks on, no boots, and we drove to school that way. Obviously, you buckled in, and we stopped on the side of the parking lot, and I was like, hey, we're at school now, and I start giving her distractions. Oh, look at that. That's your friend Rowan. That's your friend Rowan's car. That's her mom. I can see her. Oh my goodness, that's your teacher's aide, Angela. Look, she's with her daughter. I wonder what her hat looks like, just to give her insight so that her eyes can go somewhere other than the fact that giving attention to what it should be happening, such as me putting on a shirt on her. And the only way I can put it on her was to convince her that it's cold inside. And dare I, how horribly I have the car be warm for us while we're in the car waiting in the drop-off lane. And so I pulled all the windows down and I was like, look, it's really cold. And that was the only way to be able to put a shirt on her and then a jacket over her. And she still wasn't convinced. So I let her hold on to her hat and literally 
The minute that she got out of the door, she's like, mom forgot to put on my hat. This child, I tell you. And I'm like, yes, you're right. I forgot. But let's back up a little bit. And then I was able to put on her socks and her boots, but not before she had to sit like a big kid in the back of the car where I had to pretend put on the big girl car seat. And oh my goodness, this girl was grilling, grinning, and you couldn't even tell that she was crying for the last 10, 12, 25 minutes. And honestly, those are the small moments that I, I wish for and that I enjoy and linger on to a little bit more because after that, she was happy. She was chirpy she was excited to go to school she couldn't tell wait to tell me all the things that she was going to do what kind of work she was going to do her favorite is clementine work i loved seeing her light up and honestly i just went with it i didn't think too much about it i was like i'm gonna take this moment by moment and just take it in because to her she's already gotten over it and there's no point in me getting all festered up in my own emotions and holding on to something that she honestly cannot comprehend so that's how this morning went and as soon as i dropped her off I changed the music and I listened to my Christmas music and that calmed me down in order to start my day. And I just chuckled to myself because these are the moments of parenting where I'm not even going to remember. These are the so small in comparison to how I'm raising her and how cool she is. So anyway, that was my morning story. I worked really hard to keep my calm and I realized that my purpose wasn't to fuel her outrage. It was to show her how to process these hard emotions in a healthy way and that was my priority because I wish that was something that was done for me growing up instead because I it wasn't something I can consciously comprehend and I know that when I show her that she also reciprocates it because I do okay see now here's another story when she sees that I'm upset or I was annoyed about something and I go off my husband a little bit I'm not yelling I'm just a little like I noticed it you did this and it made me annoyed that's usually as far as our conversations go and she's like mom I noticed that you're a little frustrated do you need to go take a break how would you like to do that do you want to sit on the couch or do you want to go read a book like on her own and honestly in moments like that I turn around so quickly because I'm like you are listening and you're literally soaking up everything I'm saying even when you are so outraged you're listening you hear me and those are the moments that mean the most and lets me know that I'm doing a good job and my message to you mama is that you're doing a good job I've waited three years in order to see this work being reciprocated not saying that I had to wait for this long but it's just really cool to see it when it does happen in real life because it catches me and my husband off guard a lot and we kind of just chuckle like wow she really just did that (laughs) the next topic i would like to talk to you about postpartum friendships i just speaking of what happened this morning and was speaking to my recent friends school mom friends and whatnot it's helped me to be reflective of how i can help new mamas because I've got a few cousins and sister-in-laws who are having the first baby and I and I never really know how to respond or give them the best advice because a lot of it is experiencing it firsthand and when I look back on my experience I noticed right away that some friends just disappeared I get it it's uncomfortable it's weird it's I was 24 when I had my baby it was something that I planned it was something that I was already married I wanted this and so I get it mutually I get it and some it would have been a conversation it could have been a easy I noticed that this is right for you it's not right for me and I'm uncomfortable I don't know how to show up for you so this is me doing it the, the most I can with this verbal communication. Unfortunately, our brains don't have that comprehension until we're as females 25, 26 anyway, where we can emotionally regulate and communicate and use our wise mind. So I get that. I totally get that looking back now. And secondly, I won't ever forget my friends who did show up like in my comfort when I was ready and how I was ready and it was such a vulnerable time and such an exciting time overall just lots of emotions over time so looking back it means the world like I can still pinpoint who my top friends were that year whether they had children or no children how they showed up for me and just made it encouraging and in my presence of comfort and love and let me know that I was still their friend aside from now being a mom and 
I wish I don't know how to put that in like advice words, you know, like how do you say you're going to be growing so much in all the best ways and it's okay if you lose some along the way because you are worth it so much more in a whole different level, a whole different scale. And that's all right because friends kind of just fade away and sometimes it can mutually just be supporting each other from afar. I wish that was something that I was told a little bit, like just to kind of preface like, hey, it's going to be all right and this is completely normal and it's just a part of growing up. Because I I noticed that's something that's kind of a common theme. I mean, I remember being a child and being like, how come adults have no friends? Now I'm that adult that like has a hard time finding friends because there's less and less opportunities or more so it's a lot of effort to put yourself out there when you've worked so hard to be a good person and be a fun person and see another person as just human. So I just wanted to say that it took me a really, really long time though to not hold back on like the innate spitefulness of the situation because there are certainly some friends where I'm like goodness you helped me literally up until the day that I had a baby and then as soon as I did you like disappeared from like earth and you can see you on snapchat you're partying and you're doing this and it's like I celebrate you and I support you and I wish that was mutually said and so it's really hard to put it in the background and being like I love you and I support you and I wish that it wasn't this way and I wish this anger that I have or envy or not even envy, just like pure spite. I did feel that. I think that was really, really tough for me to process just because I was so happy and I was so fruitful of the moment that was going on. I just wished I would have used more of my wise mind and that's definitely a therapy talk of learning from the lesson here and honoring my friends who didn't show up and know that my decisions and my choices doesn't need to be celebrated by every single one. The most important celebration is by me because this is something that was happening to me that I had waited my whole life for. I don't know about you but I feel like when it comes to the story of mothering it's like no matter what there's always a wonderful peace that comes to it like not a piece but like the essence of peace that is like well celebrated when you have a baby and I know for me with my background I've always just loved being a mom being the mom figure being the caretaker of babies not like just anybody but like baby especially just it's it's such a delicate time and I knew it was something that I was always meant for in this world and most importantly I was like really proud that I made a human being so anybody and everybody I was like look look at the thing I made this thing is really cool it's full functioning and everything <laughs> it poops and it eats and it, it's so warm and cuddly and smells great <laughs> I was so proud of what I did especially just because like my birth story I was like this is so empowering and every woman should experience this if they want that in their life so going back to that topic of friends i did try out the peanut app and i don't know if you're familiar and i don't know if it's still a thing because i was only on it for about a year i found my friends and was kind of like eh i found my niche my niche I don't know why that came out so weird. So it's like a mom dating app and it's really cool because it's woman owned and it allows you to make a profile and everything like that. Again, like a dating profile app. And it was meant well in all the right ways, I would say, because I never found any fault in it. I especially love that I was able to find some intentional and forever mom friends that way that like aligned with my parenting and weren't racist and... (laughs) was able to be kind to my children and I was kind to their children. It was always a mutual respect of processing mothering together, if not like the experience of mothering because some of them had two or three kids or were doing newborn phase all over again while I just had my one. So it was really cool for me to have that retrospect from them. And because for them, let's say they've had three kids, in all things baby gear, it like literally changes every single year. And so for me, even if it's like your first time parenting, Trust me, there will you will never know enough about all the new stuff because next year it literally changes all over again. And yeah, I just I personally think that's just a field that's always going to keep growing because of the cool innovative stuff that they come up with. What I especially loved about this app was that we all understood like even there was nothing intimidating about it because we were all in the same place and our profiles spoke out to what we like and where we're located so you can find friends that are around your area or if you wanted that to be like a little bit in the outskirts it was really cool to see who was around without knowing all the details of like them literally being your next door neighbor so it allowed the idea of parenting and getting comfortable with being a mom and how you would like to make friends it was really cool and at your own pace so i appreciate 
appreciate that. I think I just really appreciated like the mutual, like we all understood the whole not texting back right away or texting back right away if we have a moment or getting a text at 3 a.m. because that's probably the only time that we feel we have alone time and that we want to socialize or have the energy to. That was just never questioned. Like then it's like, then I'd reply 5 a.m. or something. And it was just like, ah, oh, had a long night. Yep, you had a long night. Cool. And there's nothing quite like that and more supportive than having a community like that. So I mean, Peanut, if you want to sponsor me, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Affirmations and putting things out there. I especially love that literally when I talk about advice, I'm talking about like nipple care or vaginal tear care or like diaper pr- preferences or like a bump or a lump or if what this looks like for your kid or if they're experiencing a hard day or if you're going back to work and you just need somebody to talk to. Those are those little small intimate things that you can just lean on and this app provided that. I can't talk enough like good stuff about it. I never really had a bad experience. And sure, some friends dropped off. I mean, you had like one or two conversations and then they realized it wasn't good fit. And so just like in the dating world, you don't really know. And so you're just kind of ghosted. And so there is that part, which kind of sucks. But we're all human and everybody interacts differently. And we all live socially um, as you're listening to this podcast as a way of communication. So I personally never took too much into it just because I too was really exhausted. And so it was like, all right, on to the next person. It did suck if it's like we helped each other through a tough time and like relationships or something or you know breastfeeding milestone and then all of a sudden they drop on the face of the earth so that was a little sad (laughs) i guess that was like probably like the worst of it really and yeah so overall just it was a really nice place like it's just a nice place and because your mom's there's the idea of like being being nobodies in the world and becoming friends. I know I love my friends that I created on there. One of them I had to drop off because she was racist, but the rest of them, like, they were really cool. They're kind of scrunchy like me. They're in a biracial family format like me. So it's it's nice to find your people, especially as adults. I know there's not a lot of spaces for that, but I definitely recommend that app as a gateway to just being open to what's out there and finding adult mom millennial friendships. Because literally there's moms anywhere from like 20 to like 40 or 50 on there and I thought that was really cool so the next segment here is just all the things I wish that would have been done for me during my postpartum I just remember my fourth trimester as like a learning curve like a huge learning curve I was overwhelmed and happy all the time and I didn't know how to ask for help while I was in the trenches of figuring out what help looked like and what balance looked like because I was control freak and recovering perfectionist so I had to add things a certain way but during that time and with a newborn baby you really don't know their schedule and as soon as you know their schedule it's already on to another thing and so personally that caused a lot of anxiety for me I had postpartum anxiety specifically intrusive thoughts and I got support for for it. Thankfully, I did. And I love my therapist for it. I still see her today. She's amazing. I love her work. I'd be happy to recommend her if you wanted to send me an email. I'd be happy to send you her organization and all that. It really just helped me be a better mom and helped me reach my goals of what I wanted in my life. Currently, at that moment of becoming a mom and enjoying the essence of that while still waiting to go back to work and just relationally how to support my husband while trying to figure this out for myself. As much as I can talk about how horrible it was or how scary it was, I really am just grateful that I was able to understand the diagnosis and ask in a safe place what it all meant and what it didn't mean and be allowed to ask all those questions under the sun without being judged or feeling like I was dumb for not knowing beforehand. And I feel like that's the type of radical grace that I wish someone would have taught me a little bit about like, it's okay to not know and it's okay to not know, no, that you don't know. (laughs) Does that make sense? Because I think so much of our life we're expected to know and so much of prepping for a pregnancy and having a baby is that you should know all of these things. When you You only know literally 15% of it and the other 85% of it is figuring it out along you go. And I will talk about that in a little bit. More so, I think the part that I wish the most from like, again, my friends on the peanut app that they expressed to me that they really appreciated that I wish would have been done for me is that culturally with Hmong culture was that how you support the mother is 
is if you are on the mother side of the family or sorry if you're married into the family then it's your in-laws that care for you in the first month just because there's a lot of like spiritual religious things going on there and I feel like that really limits you I get it spiritually but mentally emotionally and I guess American spiritually, you need a little bit more support than that. And it was just nice to have that Americanized version of it that made sense with not a lot of expectations, but a lot of love behind it. Such as when you come over, don't expect me to host. I probably haven't showered or washed or my nipples are cracked. And I'm trying to figure out this whole breastfeeding thing and my boobs are engorged and my tummy's still there. And I don't know what fits me because no one makes fo- makes clothes for the fourth trimester at all. And so it's just trying to navigate that, especially because everything is so expensive for the postpartum phase as well too. So some things that I wish would have been done for me, okay, these are just examples. It's like, do my laundry, wash my dishes, let me shower, gift me with some coffee gift cards or fuzzy slippers, drop off food. Literally, I wasn't picky. It was just the essence and the effort of it that went so well. I probably cried about it. I probably did. And also, I can't care for my husband the way I did before I had a baby. And that's just the honest truth. And if you have a partner, this is very true. As much as they can take care of themselves, as much as they're taking taking care of you. They also need to be taken care of too. So it was nice if it was like not just mommy self-care, but like daddy self-care. Like he would have loved the extra fuzzy blankets as well too. Know that his name was attached to it. They are huge gentle bears as well. And yes, even though he's a grown as adult, he also would like to be celebrated that he also did an amazing thing and that he is being a good husband but taking care of his wife. And it's just, it's just nice to have that pick me up. More especially because I needed like the self-care support without taking more time of what I didn't already have or more so like I just didn't want to take more space away from like my favorite thing which is my baby. I wanted to see my baby, baby breathe, baby smell, baby moments like I wanted it all and then I think that's just like a first time mom thing but we'll see. I've only had one baby and that's gonna lead into my next point here which is give my baby back. Don't try to comfort or like make me ask for my baby back. It's vulnerable. It's embarrassing for everyone. It just is very telling of the relationship dynamic. It's just that bond. And if anything, my milk is leaking for the baby. So it probably means baby wants milk. So just give the baby back respectfully. And it does not mean anything personal about how you can't calm my baby down or anything. But I do have to preface that like you did not birth the baby, nor did you carry the baby, nor did you, are you legally binded to the baby where like that is a responsibility that you would have to be responsible for that comes off very very strong but I promise you it comes in the most tender loving care tone because I remember being a mom and just crying because it's like I just want my baby back I just want to be able to take care of my baby I just want to be the mom for the baby a lot of emotional attachments towards that and you can't really stop the tears from going from coming down it's just a part of after you have a baby you go through lots of hormonal shifts and as much as again like i said it's embarrassing for everyone so let's not embarrass the new mama and that's also the one thing i i advocate for for new moms it's just anytime their baby starts crying i just give them back or if somebody else is holding their baby and they start crying and i can see the mom kind of giving me that like i daring look daring headlight like how do i do this how do i navigate what do i say i go let's give the baby back <laughs> You know, she's really crying. Like, she's crying a lot. Like, I think her mom would know what to do. Like, you just kindly, like, wow, I, baby X is really crying. Let's give baby back. I'm sure her mama would, would know what to do. And if she doesn't, like, let's ask for her permission to see if you need support or if she needs support with the baby. I mean, those are all valid points and they're not mean spirited at all. It's literally, if you don't know how to support, ask for the support because more likely the parents probably know what to do. Like, I always knew what to do even if I was learning how to be a mom I I was always like yeah just let me feed her and then like we'll see how it goes or I'll go in the other room and that kind of signals them to leave because (laughs) there's something about not returning in 20 minutes and understanding that like they probably fell asleep or something that you they should just let themselves out that may be more like an Irish goodbye but to me it's like I don't take it personal at all like it just it's embarrassing it's very vulnerable Uh, it's just moments that like you don't know that you don't know are uncomfortable until it's there. And the last thing is when you come over, talk to me about your life. Tell me what's going on. It gives me a break from my daily, yet sometimes isolating routine. Yes, I can talk about baby. Yes, I can talk about my sleepless, tireless nights. And I can tell you all of that, but it's also nice 
to not be so exhausted all the time and talking to everybody about the same thing about baby routine can get very routine and exhausting so like I didn't need to be physically held I just needed to be like socially filled so I wanted to hear the boy talk I wanted to hear what going out was like I wanted to know like the funny stories about dumb things that they did how they tripped over themselves what's going on with work the work drama the friendship drama all of that was so inspiring and as horrible and inappropriate as it was it made me smile because those things made my day it made me feel valued it made me feel that you wanted to come to me for these things it made me feel like you actually acknowledged who I was as a human being apart from just birthing this amazing wonderful human being as well too made me feel useful and that I belonged and that I was worthy of your time and your moment and you wanted to share that with me I don't know how else to explain it but it felt really good to be needed by another adult yeah I think I think that about sums it up and also just a PSA out there if we're gonna be moms talking about unshaming I'm not talking about like parenting styles or anything like that but like I just feel like The whole idea of shaming is so thrown into the deep end so suddenly that every mama should know this. That when it comes to unshaming moms, it also means asking for support and not seeing like asking for the support as like an aggressive thing but seeing it as like an attentive tender care of like I love you and I want to do what's good for you and I don't know what that looks like so I think it's cool when you can honor yourself by honoring the person that you are trying to offer that support for because maybe your support is not the same way that they see support and so sometimes in order to make them feel heard is by you asking them how you can make them feel heard does that make sense and then do the second part which is correspond just follow through if they're like i don't need this but i need that okay if they didn't need blankets but they wanted some dark chocolate dark chocolate with caramel get that they would be so happy even if it means it's five dollars versus 25 dollars that you give them doesn't matter it's the point that you listen to them and you're following through i know like that meant everything for me like i didn't need what somebody thought was great for me i needed them to listen to what i told them was great for me and for me to speak up and say like this is why i prefer is something that was really hard and challenging for me as a recovering people pleaser and as someone who grew up in a very very passive aggressive household it was really important that becoming a mom that I was coming into my own womanhood as well too and so lastly just you know if it's ask yourself like is the thing that you're asking is that helpful kind or respectful like if not don't mention it. It's already stressful enough for them to have gotten all dressed up and out the door and ensuring that they have all their right gear and that ensuring that the mom showered and that they're, you know, not in pain from delivery. Like there's a lot that goes on in their head that they think three times over before they're wanting your two cents into how they parent, especially when they literally gave birth like 30 days ago. They just became moms. Allow them to make their own mistakes and allow them to grow from it. And maybe it's not, you are entitled to your opinion, but if it's not what they needed, it's not what they needed. And and it does not mean that they don't love you or that you aren't worthy. It literally just means they're trying to figure it out for themselves and giving them that radical grace is exactly what they need. So the thing how do I go into this? So we're all about making this cheeky, but like not too cheeky, right? And if you're my Hmong listeners, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe this. And so in a lot of Asian communities, the fourth trimester is well taken care of. So the idea of doulas is not a new concept. That's literally what our mothers are and have learned for like ancestral teachings of what happens to mothers, the whole maternal aspect of it is well taken care of. And so in my mom culture, that includes the chicken diet for 30 whole days after birth. This starts as soon as you have a baby. And right when I had my baby, I knew that when I called my mom that my baby was born, my mom was going to come over with the freshest chicken and the herbal broth. And though I love and appreciate her for, that was not after my six hours of labor, that was not maybe the first thing I wanted to eat. That wasn't what I actually ate after birth I ate like a sandwich like a nurse's sandwich because I was so hungry and I hadn't eaten and it it just it seems so good anyway back to the point the chicken diet is for 30 days and it's a herbal broth that's made with freshly uh, cleaned whole chicken parts depending on your clan you may do you know no chicken feet or chicken head and necks or anything like that For me personally, I just did like the chicken breast and the skin was kind of weird for me. So I excluded that. But it's made with various Asian mints, lemongrass, and oh so much more. It's very 
herbally rich and it's it's literally a chicken broth made from it it smells like home it's made from you can you can smell the ancestors in every single broth and you can see why and how it's so helpful so it's supposed to help with the internal healing for digestive health and also to help with the cleansing of so if you don't know when you have a baby you leak for a little bit like leak blood and you may clot and whatnot and so it kind of helps clean all of those systems out to help relieve all of that and so the clotting doesn't happen as often and so and it's helping put all of your organs and just it's it's just this nice warm blanket around your internal body and you do it for 30 days i'm sure i'm missing out on a lot of it but it's really hard to explain it in english versus like interpreting it from like my Hmong language and what it means it's it's so much more tender and it's so much more with love in the essence of how this is created and the purposes of it in your fourth trimester. So this makes a lot of sense. We uh, do this. You're supposed to be having it for like breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks and everything in between for 30 days. But I did it modified. Okay. Okay. I did it modified. And I also noticed that like, I think I did it for like five days straight. And I realized like it was really depleting my my breast milk supply. And I needed more consistency in being able to sustain that. So I started adding whole fruits and vegetables and a protein shake here and there. And obviously my coconut water and making sure that the water intake that I did take was warm. And that helped made me feel a lot better, especially because I feel like I was parched all the time, which is completely normal when you're breastfeeding. So the feeling of being thirsty was always there. And as far as like eating, like I just... I grazed like if my fourth trimester could be put in anything as far as like food I like grazed on food and I feel like that definitely helped sustain it because I was able to breastfeed for two and a half years I was like she's three now there's no way I'm still going she was two and a half years and for sure like when I started adding more food content more substance to it my milk supply was strong and I felt not as weak and I felt like I had more strength and I felt like I could actually get up and get things done and tend to my daughter and the house and my dogs so I modified and I didn't tell my mom. My mom still doesn't know. I cheated a little bit. I think my family knew, like my sisters knew, but like they kind of turned a blind eye. I have four sisters. They kind of turned a blind eye and was like, okay, just try to eat it in front of us. Pretend like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I will say through it all, I'm thankful for my husband who did make it every single morning, even when he left for work, when his postpartum, you know, workload was what is that called? Paternity. His paternity leave was up. He was able to make it for me fresh every morning. And I did have it every morning for those 30 days. And it was nice to sip on throughout the day because it was warm and healing. And I gave birth uh, end of October. So it was leading right into the winter time. So it was like Asian chicken noodle soup, but better and actually really good for your soul overall. So uh, that's my little secret uh, with the chicken diet. And I always, okay, so here's the thing. I always get really nervous when I tell this to new moms and I say it with like the utmost amount of love for like Hmong moms is like when they're like, yeah, I'm going to do it for 30 days. I'm always like, and have your crackers and your fruits and your vegetables. Like you don't need to be talking about junk food, just like whole foods because that means the world in keeping up your supply. And then you wonder why. Sorry, this is like a huge Hmong thing, which is that like we're slowly moving away from like our ancestral ways of like breastfeeding and supporting that and what that means and moving more towards like just easily switching over to formula no problem with formula it's just there's lots of misconceptions said and done because of the perceptions that are within the culture when it comes to fully doing just all herbal broth and that being mixed in between the whole like i get it that's all that we had back then as well too but obviously like there was more like we need to preface it and bring it back up to like modern days of like how do you breastfeed and what are the actual facts of that versus just what ancestrally what our parents are saying because they've experienced you know trauma of their own as well too does that make sense so it's a mix of a few things but it's still the idea that we need more support of four moms overall no matter what your journey is in postpartum okay so i think i feel like i've talked about that a lot the one thing i would like to do that i know i did that is just kind of controversial is uh i i had a natural birth i kind of was feeling the whole ancestral healing ancestral birth this whole wholesome concept spinning babies concept and it was just it just it just felt very 
at home. Like I felt like I was nesting and it felt very much like this is how it should go. And I wanted to be in comfort of that, especially because labor is so quick to be medically intervened. And I get it if you have high risk pregnancies, if there's something else going on, I totally get it. But mine was a healthy one. And so I got medical care through midwives and at a birth center and nothing was, I was never in a gown or anything like that. Everything was, it was literally like I sat in someone's living room and got care for like nine months and that was amazing and it just made my pregnancy overall a well balance. And I think that's like what contributed to my most primal feeling (laughs) when I pulled up my baby like Kim Card, like Kourtney Kardashian did. And honestly, that was the highlight of my birth especially when my midwife knew how much I love these moments. And so she like asked me like, do you want to pull out your baby? And I was like, yeah. And so the baby was, Eva was already shoulders out and I just grabbed right under her shoulders and pulled her out and it was amazing. It was awesome. We had a videographer there and she captured it so well. So that's just a little bit uh, how my natural birth went. I did have, end up getting epidural. I don't think it actually worked because within the 20 minutes I gave birth and so and also you're supposed to get a catheter by the time I had a baby and I was already crowning but she was crowning it was already too late and also after you have a baby you're not supposed to be to like stand up and walk to the bathroom and then feel your legs and I was and so that shocked all the nurses and so I'm like yeah I don't think the epidural did what it was supposed to be doing so that's just one of the many things that made me kind of a taboo in American and even Hmong birthing. Another thing is I waited out my labor for 16 hours after getting confirmed the status of my labor. This in getting officialized in that I was in labor, I went outside the hospital. I never stepped foot until the next day at like 3 a.m. just because my midwife was at the hospital. It wasn't like there was anything concerning that led me to be in the hospital anyway. And so it was really cool that when my water broke, (laughs) which would be a story for another time because I think it was the best way to have my water be broken. But it was definitely like, uh, yeah, that was my water that broke. We checked in with my midwife every hour. And then when we did feel like that was the water breaking, we confirmed at the birth center and we were kind of just having this waiting peaceful moment giddy anxiety but yet it was overall so calming and peaceful because I knew that little girl was coming and honestly it was the biggest secret kept between just me and my husband for so long we even went out for his birthday dinner that night with his family and they all did not know that I had been laboring all day and then the next day I gave birth like just right before noon (laughs) And I guess you can say everybody was pretty surprised then when that anticipation of like they wish they would have known. But again, my little secret that for the rest of the world, it was just me and her. I think what made it all the more wholesome and healing for me was that night I took a bath and we had a talk and I just talked about how excited I was to welcome her in the world. And before I knew it that night, a few hours later, I was cramping really bad and, and you know, the bloody show was starting and I knew it was, it, we were getting there, like it was getting serious. So just little tidbits of my birthing story, but definitely things that made my birth a little bit more taboo. If you're talking about like traditional birthing. And one thing that made it a little bit different is that I had a herbal bath shortly after birth. This is so cool. My midwife, they make this as like part of like their postpartum care. It's made with all these amazing local homegrown organic herbs. And it's made specifically per birthing mother. And I love that. And she brought it in even though I had a hospital. I ended up with a hospital birth because my midwife was already at the hospital. It was so nice to have that because it smelled so good of like lemon balm and lavender and thyme it was it was so cool i will also say these next two you're gonna be like oh my god i can't believe you actually did that so as soon as she was born literally it came out and i grabbed her she was already on my boob like we started breastfeeding right there on the spot and it was really cool because in the video you can also see like she found it like right away without my support or you know someone finding the nipple to the mouth like she just latched on so perfectly it was kind of a shirt cry until she was fed and so that that was all great promises from the midwife the nurses in the room to my husband and for me it was really cool to see how primal 
it was. <laughs> That's the best word I can use to describe it. This next one, you're gonna be like, oh my god. <laughs> so in the Hmong culture, there's this thing about placenta that in the olden days, you carry the placenta and you put it in front of your front steps and so that in your afterlife, when you've passed, your spirit can find it and go home in order to walk over into the next life. And I think that's super cool, but we no longer live in villages or huts and the medical evidence of what's backed behind placenta encapsulation is actually really, really cool, um, especially because it's the one organ that your body has made over the course of nine months, in addition to all the body parts and making a sufficient human being come out of you. It's just your organ. So to me, I wasn't grossed out by it. It's it's yours. I mean, it's not like eating your finger or anything, but it's the idea that like it can get cleaned, it can get steamed, it can get oven baked and then crumbled down and into, and then powder and then encapsulated. So I briefly just talked about how it's done. I highly, highly, highly vetted out my doula who did that. She talked to me about the whole process, any questions I had and had prepped and knew when I was going to have my baby. It's really cool because she's just like, you're going to have it on this day. And I'm like, oh, that's a week out. She's like, don't worry about it. And I'm like, all right. So it was really cool. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit. So after I birthed the placenta, we, my midwife knew and was already on this as well too. So even though the hospital nurses and everything like that were in the room, it was my midwife who had the last call and say on anything medically that was going to happen to me. And so she knew that we were going to plan that. And so we had a large plastic uh, Ziploc bag, put it on ice in a cooler and the doula came and picked it up um, shortly after to be encapsulated, and that was it. So now you may be wondering, like, well, how do you know that it's yours? She does them in small batches. Um, she does tender care. Like, she expertly wants to make sure that it's yours and like she's not in the business of bad business. And so she really, you can tell she's a genuine person and she's not about making this more complicated than it needs to be and she's all about like the goodness of of placenta encapsulation and that she has well vetted herself to be good at knowing how to do this correctly especially is of it being like a bodily fluid organ type thing so the thing is i got it back like we literally left she got it back within 24 hours and came back with it and was like, here you go. You had a huge placenta. I was able to make, you know, so-and-so amount. I think it was like three to six months, depending if I took up to six a day or if I just took two a day. And so to me, every day after I had my baby, I took two to four, depending on how I was feeling that day, if I was feeling a hormonal shift, if I was just crankier that day. But overall, for maintenance care, I took about two. I can also tell you that from my own experience, not an expertise here, but just my own experience, this helped with the milk, milk flow and this helped with like the body healing. Like I got stronger with it. I felt more like me. And honestly, it settled a lot of like the weird blood clotting, like just weird lows of hormonal shifts that would happen when I forgot to take it or whatnot. And I can tell it just really helped settle the healing down there. I didn't necessarily tear, but I had just a little bit. It couldn't even be considered like a first degree, but it helped with the pain management of that. And so I definitely loved it. My sister smelled the cap and was like, oh, what is this? And it literally smelled like steak. So not a bad thing to smell. I mean, if you think about it, that would make sense. And then I had explained to her what it was. And yeah, people were mostly grossed out. So I don't necessarily talk about it a lot. Would I do it again? In a heartbeat. For sure. Will I talk to anybody who would listen? Oh, yeah. Because I think it's so cool. And I think people get too grossed out before they even know all the cool benefits of it is. And honestly, I did not list all of them. I just listed what helped me. So please do not take what I'm saying as medical advice or anything like that. But just more so my own personal human experience. All right, that's all the conversation that I had planned out for today. We can definitely go through one of the tidbits here. Let's see. Adulting is hard. This is the last one here, which is one thing you wish someone taught you about being responsible for the rest of your life. That adulting phases are always going to be there and then does not get any harder whether you have a child or not. It's just a means of what is the quality of life that you'd prefer to have. Personally, for me, even having a child and my husband, we talk about this 
this almost on the daily of like what we want our life to look like and the outlook of it and what lifestyle we want to continue providing. Because definitely we've we've gotten bougie. Yeah, yes, uh, yes. And uh, we love our bougie life that we can afford our bougie life, especially as people of color we've worked hard for this with we were not raised with like a silver spoon or anything like that so a lot of what we pride ourselves on and uh, live our lifestyle by is because we truly are proud of ourselves and are so proud and of how far we've come and celebrating all of our accomplishments for each other and individually as well too and i think that's like the part that i think a lot of millennials who don't have children are like oh i already have such a hard time taking care of myself i don't know how to take care of a baby and it's like i think it's more so you need to start asking yourself what kind of quality of lifestyle you're asking for and the means of what it would be like to raise a human being not necessarily just the idea of taking care of something else because i know that in itself is a little shallow in thinking not that it means to but i totally get it when that is you know your lifestyle because trust me we have friends where it's like you're still doing the same thing as if you turned 21 yesterday and that's okay with me and i am proud of you and i'm excited to celebrate you but no i cannot do it friday saturday and sunday i can probably do it saturday and come at nine and then leave at like 11 30 so i'm not gonna be able to hit the clubs with you but i can definitely pregame with you and then go home and it's not that i'm boring (laughs) and it's not that i don't want to go out it's literally because i just don't enjoy that anymore like i find more of these conversations that i'm having with you more joyful and more concerning in a good way and to be able to express out loud and have these i don't know they're more rich than having a lifeless moment of let's see how fast we can black out which is completely fine if that's your life but I know I enjoy my bougie lifestyle a little bit more, especially because it's I'm still in my 20s here and uh, I know it's well-deserved this way and I wouldn't have any other way because I worked so hard to have everything that I have now. All right, I think that's about the end of the episode. I'm so glad that you joined me and I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of The Necessary Break with your host, Philantha. We love that you enjoyed yourself with this episode. Send us a voice memo of your favorite moment. Write a five-star review and click subscribe to be the first to listen to the next episode. See you next week.